Oh, today, the message is entitled, The Virtues of Love. Sounds like a 60s um, title of a love song, right? <laughs> I don't know that there is, but it uh, sounds like one to me. I looked up the word virtues because I really wanted to understand what that word is. It's not one that we use a lot, virtues. Here's what I found that really fits the, 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 the substance of my message. It reads, it's a behavior showing high moral standards. Virtues means a behavior showing high moral standards. And so we looked, uh, last week we talked about the value of love and, uh, and really uh, looked at the fact that God is love and we'll hit that a little bit today and uh, God, God shows himself by the actions he does. He calls that love. And uh, last week was, a, again, just a great message of, of really looking at do we value agape love like God is? I also last week mentioned that uh, I, I mentioned I talked about four different loves in the Greek language that are identified as love. We in the English language only have one word for love, but the Greek has four. And I kind of just casually mentioned mentioned that there were seven words in Greek that were uh, identified as love. And so I never really dug into those extra three. I primarily concentrated on the four, so I decided to dive in. I was like, I'm going to find out the other three. Uh, so I, I'm going to spare you the names of the Greek word, but I'm going to give you the meaning of it, all right? Because I didn't, I wouldn't, didn't want to take time to learn the word. Um, again, I was focused on what it meant. So we start out here this morning, a summary of loves plus three. And First John, we're going to get, uh, just, just by way of saying, we're going to get to our text in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, but it's going to not be till point 3, all right? So don't get nervous. I didn't forget the text this morning. We're just going to get there for a while. But 1 John, again, talks a lot about love. And 1 John 4, 16 reads, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in him. So as we look at these four basic loves that I mentioned last week, again, as a, as a summary, we had, I start out with Jesus, which is agape love. Then we talked about family love. We talked about friendship love and romance love. We're coming up here on February the 14th, where the world celebrates romance love. Those are the four that we concentrated on last week. And then, of course, we were highlighting agape love. But as I jumped into the added three, I think you will probably agree that the, when we do these, we're actually conveying love, or think we are, so to speak, and the world certainly does. So the number five, I guess we would say, is this is a love displayed by playful teasing or even flirting. You get that? Playful teasing someone or even flirting with someone is a Greek word that identifies a love. And obviously, we do that as Christians. I mean, I will pick on my wife, and, and she doesn't care for it too much until we get to vacation. And then she relaxes, and she starts picking on me. That's just kind of the way it works in our household. So uh, we have this understanding, you know, I'm teasing her and stuff. She's like, I'll get out of here. And then we go on vacation. She starts teasing me, and I have to adjust. No, I like it. I'm like, okay, now you're relaxed. We're having a great time. But we do, you know, that's, that's the way it is. It's kind of a playful, fun type of love, poking at somebody, and they're like, quit it. Well, we're actually showing that we love them by doing that, even though it may not be received that way. That's where really all the jokes come from about love. It really is in this, this section. For instance, what's the difference between marriage and a video game? They both start off fun and easy, then they get a little harder, and they get real hard, and you win in the end, and everybody's shocked. Uh, the most dangerous sport, here we are on Super Bowl day, the most dangerous sport in the world is for a husband to disagree with his wife. <laughs> Wives, the best way you get to your husband to do something is to suggest he's too old to do it. <laughs> At every social gathering, there are two kinds of people, those who want to go home and those who don't. The trouble is they're usually married to each other. <laughs> When your spouse gets a little upset, just remember this. Just speak real calmly and say, calm down, and that's a sure way to get them more upset. <laughs> All right, so teasing, fun, loving, that's a way of displaying love. The next one is a duty or an obligation. You know, you're just going to make it work regardless. That is a form of love. 
This is not necessarily a, a, a fun way to love, but it is a commitment. It's a, you know, I don't have any emotion anymore, but I'm just going to plow through. I'm going to persevere even though my heart's not in it, my emotions are not in it. It's just, I'm, I'm just going to keep on going. And that is a, a form of love as well. It's like the, um, the day when the husband stood before his wife. You've probably heard this one, and he said, I love you that day. And, and then he never said it since. And about 30 years went by, and she said, aren't you going to tell me you love me? And he said, well, I told you once on that day. If anything changed, I'll let you know. I, I would call that a... A duty kind of love. That's not necessarily fun to be around. Then the last one is one that is really we're bombarded with in the world. And this is a self-centered, egotistical, narcissistic love. Yeah, really. It is a form of love. It's displayed in the world constantly. It's what we oftentimes get exposed to in the movies of, or stories that we see. It's this um, love that's centered on my feelings and my needs and my wants and just, you know, all that you can cram into that. It's really a very low-level bottom feeder kind of love, and it doesn't really go anywhere, and the only person that enjoys that kind of love is the person that's inviting it, and nobody else wants to be around an individual like that. So I wanted to add those three other forms of love so you get the total picture of the seven different ways to love. But obviously today we're focused on agape love and that which we get from Christ and to understand how when we have agape love that feeds into all the other loves and it changes the motivation and reason why we love in that way when we have agape love from God in our hearts, in our lives, and then we're displaying that to others. So number two, I want to define agape love. This is a tall order because it's really defining God. How do you do that? Well, everything we come up with is usually inadequate. But I wanted to just again highlight another verse out of 1 John. This is uh, chapter 4, 10, and 11. This is love, not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Now, really embedded in these two verses, we really have four things that we can learn about agape love that, uh, that I think are helpful to describe it. The first one is that agape is not just what God does, it's also who he is. I want you to understand that. It's not just what he does, but it's also who he is. In other words, it's his, it's his essence not just his attribute. It's, it's God's, God's, he's fine with saying that he's love. If you want to describe God to somebody, it's okay with him to say, you can say God is love. I'm good with that. In fact, I read earlier verse, I started out on point number one, God is love. And so we find out here that, um, that God is, it's, it's who he is, not just what he does. And so therefore, as we get agape love active in our life, then it's going to be who we are, not just what we do. They are a loving person, not just that they did something for me that was loving. And that comes into our life as well. It becomes who we are as individuals and collective bodies. We love people, not just, again, what we do. The second aspect of, of defining agape love is that it's both unconditional and conditional. It's both unconditional and conditional. Now, when people talk about God's love, they, they think that it's unconditional. In other words, they can experience all of what God has for them just by believing that God is love. And that's not true. But the unconditional aspect of God's love is that every human being that is alive today can receive God's love in their heart. You don't have to you know, earn something or gain something or, or, or be righteous to get it or be evil so that you turn. You, none of those things qualify. It's just receiving God's love. And that's unconditional. Everybody can have it. Everybody can receive it. That's the unconditional part of God's love. Now, if you want to experience what really God has to offer, like the favor he offers and the ability to walk through difficult situations and be happy and to overcome certain things in our lives, we do that with his unconditional love, but it's because we've received Jesus. That's the conditional part. 
If you want the unconditional part of God love, God's love, it's available for all. But if you want to receive it into your life and experience it, then you have to receive Jesus. That's the conditional part of God's love. You don't get it unless you receive Jesus. And when you receive Jesus into your life, then you have access to this unconditional agape love. It's available for all, but not all receive it. But those that do then begin to experience this unconditional love. That's the way it, way it, it works. And sometimes that's confusing for people because they just think that God's handing out everything to everybody. At, 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 yeah, it's available, but it's not received until you receive Jesus. The third aspect about defining agape love is that God, once he reaches us and we receive it, then we reciprocate. So we receive it. And, and he reaches out to us, we receive it, and then we reciprocate to others. We love God and we love others. That's the way it works when love comes into our, our life. I, I read, read the verse earlier. Let me read it again. It says that this is love, not that we love God. So we didn't take the first step. He did. Then after that, it says, but, he, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. We had some things in our lives that need to be cleaned up need to be washed away, need to be deleted. God is the one that does that for us. We can't do that for ourselves or we would already have done it. He needs to do that for us. And so he comes in and Jesus lived this sinless, sinless life so that we could again have our sins atoned for. And then what happens after we receive that? He says, dear friends, since God so loved us, he forgave us, what happens to us? He says, then we should also love one another. Again, we're not doing it in our own strength. We're doing it on the strength that God provides through his agape love. So God reaches out to us, we receive it, and then we reciprocate to God and others. The final thing is this, that God displays his love through what is done. God displays his love for what he has done. It's not just who he is, it's also what he does. God never, God's love is never displayed on intentions. He's never pondering something and thinking about it. He's always ready to move into action. That's how God shows his love. And we have to remember that we on our human side, we ponder things, we think about things, we, we wonder if someone deserves it or not. That's not God. That's not agape love. Agape love is moving into action right away to do that which he has decided beforehand to do. And therefore, as a result of that, that he displays his love through what is done we don't often do that. All right, number three. Let's dive into a demonstration of that love. Now from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. And it always perseveres. A demonstration of God's love. Let's walk down through all of these verses and all the, all the words. Here we go. It starts out this, love is patient and kind. I thought to myself, why, why did God choose those two? I mean, that's part of the fruit of the Spirit. It's listed as a fruit of the Spirit. But God chose these two to demonstrate or to describe what love is. Love is patient and love is kind. And I got to thinking about that and I thought, well, that makes sense because if someone is patient, they're really showing kindness, right? If someone's patient with you, you think they're very kind, and so it makes sense. They're kind of flowing in with uh, one another. So if you do something, uh, an act of patience, you're also showing kindness. I was at Walgreens the other week, and uh, I purchased uh, a uh, car charger. My, it, it, mine, I don't know, just doesn't work anymore. So I'm getting a new one at Walgreens, and I could go up to pay. There's a guy in front of me, and he's trying to figure out how he's going to pay for what he's buying and so he's kind of getting out his, his uh, 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 billfold. He's walking through his credit cards. And 
He's deciding which one to use and tried one that didn't work. And, and so then he's trying to figure it out more and I'm sitting there going, okay. And uh, then he pulls out another one and he puts it in and the, the bill was actually $21, uh, $20 and 20 cents, 21 cents. And uh, he puts that in and that didn't work. Pulls out another and said, oh, wait a minute. So he pulls out a $20 bill to then pay for it. But then he says, well, then I'll put the 21 cents on my debit card. And he tries that and that doesn't work. So now he's frustrated. The clerk is embarrassed. He's embarrassed. I'm like, pulled him out. I said, I have a dollar here. I can give you here. Let's take care of this. Well, you would have thought I opened up a treasure box right there. I mean, I got to God bless you out of that. The guy just turned around and said, God bless you. And I'm like, I'll take that. And, and the clerk was so appreciative. She was like, oh, that was just a wonderful thing that you did. I just wanted to get through the line, you know. <laughs> but I, I, I did want to show some kindness as well. But, you know, we do things like that. It was just one of those moments you uh, realized. But the thing that I, I realized out of that moment is one simple act that's out of the ordinary, suddenly the whole atmosphere changes where you're at. And it doesn't take much. I mean, it cost me 21 cents. And yet, it was etched on that man's mind, it was etched on the clerk's mind, it was etched on my mind. What just a small difference can make a huge change. And that's agape love in action. So love is patient, love is kind. I was reminded of 2 Peter 3, 9, where it says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. What a great verse. The Lord's not slow in coming. He's patient because he doesn't want people to perish. He wants them to come to life through him. And then I thought about Romans chapter 2, verse 4 in the New Living Translation. It reads this, Don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that His kindness is intended to turn, uh, to, to turn you from your sin? It's His kindness that turns us away from the things that we're doing wrong that are opposed to him. It's his patience that waits. And so God is patient. That's a demonstration of his love. So next we dive into what love does not do. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. Love does not get proud. Let's look at those three words together. First of all, envy. What does the word envy mean? It essentially means that you're jealous of something that someone else has that you don't yet. That's what envy is. You're jealous that someone got blessed and you haven't yet. You're jealous that someone graduated and you're still working on it. You're jealous that someone got a new house and you're still living in the place that you are and you desire a new house and it hasn't happened yet. Envy. That happens a lot on social media posts. <laughs> I mean, people are posting how wonderful things are, how amazing their vacation is, and how their new car is working well. And we see those posts and those places and those pictures, and we're like, oh, we get envious. Yet in reality, we wouldn't want their life behind those posts. We wouldn't want to live in their home. We wouldn't want to have their job. But yet those posts make it seem so wonderful that we crave and we get envious because of what is posted there it says that love does not envy, agape love. The next word is that does not boast. Boast means to excessively brag on oneself. That's what boasting means. Now, not to be confused with boasting in the Lord. Paul did that. He said, I boast in the Lord. What is he doing? He's saying that I'm, I'm boasting that God did this. This was not my human efforts. I participated in what God was doing, and yay, he's amazing. That's boasting in the Lord, and yet that's not what this is saying. This is saying when we just boast in ourselves. And then the, the, the final phrase there, uh, or, or word there in this one, is it does not get proud. It does not get proud. The word proud means to be puffed up or inflated. That's simply that. That's what it means to be proud. And again, 
it's, uh, it's, it's really focused on self. Now, we can be proud of our kids. We can be proud of, of you know, maybe an, uh, a, an accomplishment somebody got. It's okay to be proud of our children and, and proud of what somebody is doing. But when it's focused on self, again, that's not agape love. And so we don't need to confuse what it is and what it isn't. The next set of, of words that we have of what agape love is not it says, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, and is not easily angered. All right, let's dive into these three. First of all, it says it's not rude. What does it mean to be not rude? The Greek word says to, to, be, uh, to not behave unseemingly. That's the definition that it's given. To not behave unseemingly. To me, rude would be the opposite of patience. If you're not patient, then you end up being rude. That would be my understanding. You know, I find that, that a lot of uh, today you read the captions of, of media. There's a lot of clickbait on there. And I, f I find those, those, those statements rude of what they say about people and what they say about what the article's about. Sometimes I'll click on something just because I'm curious. And the article has nothing to do with the title that it was given. They just want to row you up so that you'll click on it. Again, it's, I find them rude at times. This is, a, you know, the lowest level of expression is to, to um, um, again, to be, uh, to be rude. Um, and so then the next one is to not be self-seeking. It kind of speaks for itself, doesn't it? That you're seeking self and only yourself. You're not interested in God. You're not interested in others. You're just only looking after yourself. This is really what I call the lowest level. This is the bottom feeder of what uh, um, the world might call love. And yet it's not agape love at all. The next one we have is not easily angered. Hello. Not easily angered. Our Western culture is a very hurried culture. We like to live in the left lane, right? We don't like to get in the right lane. We like to stay in the left lane. We have our day planned out. We don't have a lot of space in our day that we can actually, you know, maybe ponder for 15 minutes or have a conversation with somebody spontaneously because we are efficient. We have decided that we're, that's not efficient to step outside of what we had planned. And if it doesn't go well and doesn't go right, boom, we're easily angered. But it says that love is not that way. Agape love doesn't function that way. It's not easily angered. What is the one phrase when you go out into retail stores that clerks will tell you all the time? What do they say? Sorry for your weight. Right? That's what happens to me. I go out. I might be the second person in line, but they repeat it like a robot. Sorry for your weight. What's the big deal with my weight? I mean, I can hang out in the line a little bit. You know, and look around, see what else I need to buy and the, you know, the little items there and go, no way, they're way overpriced and I don't need it. Yeah, so again, we live in a very hurt culture and so it's very easy to get anger, angry over insignificant things. It says that we shouldn't get angry, it just says don't get easily angered. There's a difference between getting angry. God gets angry. But his anger is very purposeful and is very controlled. And yet today, we can get angry. It says not easily angered. In other words, if somebody pokes me once and I go, ah, I'm ready to fight you, then I'm easily angered. If they poke me once and I'm going, okay, they poke me twice, okay, they poke me three, uh, they poke me four, they poke me five, and then I'm like, I think I'm angry at you. That's not easily angered. So you have to understand that if you get poked or things don't go your way or things are, are not as efficient as you like and you fly off the handle easily angered, then you need more agape love in your life because that doesn't display agape love. Maybe this was written for our day. I'm sure every culture dealt with that, but it's not a characteristic of agape love. Then we get to a next one. This is amazing stuff, isn't it? Yeah, this hits where the heart is. Love keeps no record of wrong. The literal translation of this would be, love does not think about evil done. Love does not think about evil done. So 
Why doesn't it? Because we forgive. That's why. And true forgiveness is when you forgive somebody, you actually hit the delete button, and that is gone into the abyss, never to be picked up again. And yet, in long-term relationships, including marriages, oftentimes we may forgive our spouse for things done, and yet when something happens again that either is the same or mirrors something that happened before, instead of just isolating and dealing with this one, we go back and we bring all the others that we had forgiven and we make them current again. Hello, you're starting to whisper now. Instead of realizing, wait a minute, I kept no record of wrong. I hit the delete button on all of those. Why am I bringing them back? Agape love is, no, they were deleted. Now deal with this one in front of you. This one's new and fresh. Deal with that one. But don't bring up those that happened years and years and years ago. This hasn't happened to one and I recently, but it's probably... Um, out of four or five years ago, we were, we were in this, this one. It was like everything was being brought back. And we, uh, a different, we'd stop each other and go, Whoa, wait a minute, when was the last time I did that? I can't remember. <laughs> well, then don't bring it up if you can't remember. Yeah. So agape love doesn't keep a record of wrong. It forgives the delete button. New things happen. Yes, agree. You forgive those as well. And then you keep on walking forward. I'm not saying that people continue in an abusive situation and sometimes we have to identify what abuse is today. It's way out of whack. Some's legitimate and some is not. But I am saying that we should not. Agape love functions is we don't keep a record of wrong. The next phrase is this. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. That's significant because the world is making up their own truth. This is my truth. This is your truth. You can have your truth. This is my truth. This is a truth. That's not what the Word of God says. It says the truth. That we actually rejoice with the truth. In other words, it's outside of us and comes into us. And we recognize that it's God's truth living in us. It's not something we made up on our own or decided for ourselves. But it's something that God has brought into our lives. And it's the truth. It says that love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And that's, a, that's a, a, a tough thing to say because sometimes even in the, you know, we make decisions about what's true or not over a 30-second announcement or over a three-minute interview. And we make a decision about what's truth or not over that short period of soundbite. In reality, there's way more to the story than just that three minutes or that 30 seconds or that you know, whatever it was, there's way more. And we have to dig out and decide what the truth is and what it's not. The interesting thing is that today, when Christians stand up for the truth that's in the Word of God, it's considered hate speech. So what do we do with that one? Well, Jesus spoke to it. He said, if they hate you, remember this, they hated me first. Okay? Keep that in perspective. And then agape love doesn't even give us an out. It says to love your enemies. Wow. That's tough. But that's how agape love functions. Love your enemies. Before I leave this section, I want to just kind of lay out for you the opposite you know, there was a lot of negative. Agape love is not, it's, it's, it's not this, it's not that, it's not that. So what is the flip side of that? Here's what I found. The opposite of envy is generosity. The opposite of boasting is sober judgment. The opposite of proud is humble. The opposite of rude is polite. The opposite of self-seeking is the other person's welfare. The opposite of easily angered is calm. The opposite of no record of wrongs is total forgiveness. And finally, the opposite of delighting in evil is rejoicing with the truth. There's the opposite of that which says agape love is not. Now we get to the final, verse 7, where it talks about four words 
that love is, agape love is. It says that uh, love always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, and it always perseveres. The literal word there translated always is in all things, in all things, everything. So always is really a great word. It's really a great word, translation there. Now for you and I, always is not a great word. You know, when we're talking to somebody, we're working out a disagreement, and that person says, you always or you never, it's, you know, hey, come on, our memories aren't that great. No, it's not always and never. That's the first flag that something's going wrong. <laughs> but for God, he can't lie. So for him, it is always given. Us, we're imperfect. We forget. We get caught up in the emotion of the moment. But God, he, can't, he doesn't. He, he can't lie. So for him, this is always true. And as our life is filled more with agape love, then these things will function in and through us towards others. Here's the first one. Love always protects. The word picture given there is a roof over our head. If you feel, you know, if it's raining out or snowing or, or hail coming down and you have a roof over your head, you feel protected. That's the word picture here, protects. Love protects. Puts a roof over our head. It covers us. The next one that, um, that it says there is that uh, love um, always trusts. Love always trusts. Now, um, when you think about uh, love trusting, this word is really interesting because as I dove into it, it means that you're always in faith. When you're trusting, that means you're in faith. So if you're in love, you're always in faith. You're never in doubt. You're never in fear, fear of man, not fear of God. You're never in fear of man or fear of the future or fear of your health or fear of, well, of what might not happen. You're never in fear of that. You're, uh, when you're in love, he says that you're always in faith. And that's how agape love works, that we stay in faith together. So if you're out of faith, you're probably out of love too. And you increase your love, you increase your faith. Then it says love always hopes. Hope really looks for the best. Isn't that what hope is? You want the best for a certain person, or you want the best for yourself, or you want this to turn out the best. That's hope. That's how hope operates. And so God says, that's how I think. That's my agape love coming to you. It, my love always hopes that the best is going to turn out for you. I am for you, not against you. That's how God thinks. And so, again, when agape love comes into our heart, then we begin to hope in the same way. We have, a, we have a, a, an anticipation towards the future because we hope. And then the last one is love always perseveres. This means that we keep going regardless. We go to the end. Why? Not regardless, because God is with us. He's decided he's going to accompany us. And so therefore, he and I and you and together, we're going to keep going on this thing all the way in. We're going to persevere because we know that God is with us and we'll have the breakthrough and the victory eventually. And so we persevere all the way to the end. Now here's the big challenge for us today in regards to this message. When we look at the word virtues, that means showing high moral standards. We look at that today, we have to ask ourselves, what are we being faced with today in the world as believers and followers of Christ? The Apostle Paul wrote Timothy, his spiritual son, and this was the last letter before he stepped over to be on the other side with Jesus. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 was the last letter before Paul passed on to the other side. And he writes this to Timothy in chapter 4 of Timothy, verses, or chapter 3 of Timothy, verses 1 through 4. He says, mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. There's actually a whole lot more in those four verses. I just kind of summed it out for you. But it's not a pleasant environment to live in. Would you agree? But Paul says, Timothy, you're going to face a culture like this. 
Well, he could very well be speaking of our culture today, couldn't he? But he told Timothy, you're going to face this too. And so sometimes, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. It's just the fact that this is the reality with the world. And so as we look at this, how do we then take that which is identified as agape love and how do we begin living it in the world? And here's really the challenge that we are, are faced with. Because without agape love functioning in our lives, we're just into our best efforts. We're into what we understand because we're not being fed from God himself. We're into how the culture accepts what is right and what is wrong and what is love and what is not. That's the level that we, we function in. And yet as followers of Christ, we realize, wait a minute, there's a higher level that we pull from and operate in that has much blessing beyond what the world is experiencing. However, today, we are being mandated by the world to accept what God states as sin. And that's a challenge today for us. Namely, I'm speaking of abortion, same-sex marriage, transgender, and diversity, equity, inclusion training that's being given to corporations and educational institutes all across America. It's been happening for a while. And all of those, if you, if you look at why they're being done, they're being done in the name of love. If you love, you will have an abortion because you can't take care of it. If you love, you can marry whoever you want to and it'll go well with you. If you love, you can decide what kind of gender that you want and go for that. If you love, then you really have to put down another race in order to build you up. It's all done in the world's eyes in the name of love. But is it agape love? No, it's not. It's not how God thinks. It's not who God is. God's already decided on those things. And so we live in this world that is calling us, why can't you love? In other words, we're just stating truth. And in reality, what's happening is the truth is being interpreted as we hate them. Because that's all the world at best can do. They can't separate out the person from the sin. But we with agape love can actually separate out the individual of who God created and say they were created in the image of God. They don't know Christ yet, but they were created in the image of God. Yet yeah, what they're into and what they're doing is called sin, but we can still love the person and we can still not agree with or accept their sin. And that's how agape love functions. And that takes a maturity in the body of Christ that we're going to get to next week because we're going to talk about the victory of love. And yet that is the reality of how God calls us to live. I was in seminary and, and uh, uh, there was, uh, um, we knew a friend and his, his uh, parents came to visit. We... Um, uh, I, I struck up a conversation. He was a retired pastor. And um, he wrote a book called Love, Love, Love. And I was really interested about his story. So I took him out for lunch and just got to listen. And he began to tell me that as a young pastor, as a growing pastor, he was in love with doctrine. And all of a sudden he realized that being in love with doctrine, he wasn't in love with people. And God really convicted him and began to give him a revelation of how much love is, is through, through this book and he began to study and he began to teach and he began to learn and he began to think differently and treat his wife differently and his family differently because he got a revelation of love, not just doctrine. And he said that he began to teach in his church and for three years he preached nothing but love. <laughs> he said, they got so sick about hearing about love. <laughs> he said, until you start doing this, I'm not going to stop preaching about it. <laughs> so they started doing it. And... Their church started about 1,200 at that time when he started preaching. It was 3,000 when he got done. Because they just started doing agape love. Wow. What difference would our families be if we started really understanding what it's not and what it is and we started practicing? I mean, it might jolt some people first. Like, wow, you, you did this for me? I heard a story couple wasn't having, having uh, real challenges 
And uh, the counselor said, here's what I want you to do. And told the wife, I want you to get up. He, your, I, your husband loves pancakes. I want you to get up and make him pancakes every morning. Not have a discussion, just make pancakes. So that's what she did. She got up and she made him pancakes. He's like, why are you doing this? She said, because I love you. Next, next day, made him pancakes. Next, third day, made him pancakes. By about the fourth day, he's breaking down, weeping and crying and repenting for how he treated her. And it just was because a, an agape gesture of pancakes. <laughs> God can use anything. And we have to tap in to how he wants us to love those that are unlovable. Because he doesn't give us an out. He says, if they're hating you, they hated me first. And he says, I want you to love your enemies. I want you to separate out that which they're doing compared to who they actually are and who they're created to be. And love that, but not agree with what they're doing. Because what they're doing and advocating is sin in God's eyes. So we have to walk this line as we walk through this life. But according to Timothy, our situation has happened before because Paul wrote to Timothy all those things were like, he's talking about our culture. He's talking about Timothy's culture. And so it's in the world all over the place. The world is starved of a, of a display of agape love. That's what the world is starved with. Sometimes we have to understand it as God's people before we start practicing it. I want you to think that as I went down through that list, that love is not, love does not, love is. Uh, I want you to go down through that list in your mind. And maybe there's one of those to say, you know what, I think, I'm, I think I need agape love in this area. I'm easily angered, or maybe I'm rude, or maybe I'm not patient. Maybe I'm not kind. One of those things, just one, to say, you know what, I want God's agape love to fill me this morning so that I respond differently than what I have been. Is there just one of those that God has shown you? Did you say, I need more of God's agape love? Just one? In fact, if there is, and you know what that one is, just stand up. I want to pray for you before I leave. If you're just one of those, you realize, wow, I need more of agape love in this one. Just, just stand up. I just want to pray for you. You're really not standing up for me to see. You're standing before God. And He knows your heart. He knows your intentions. And he's ready to come and help you and fill you with his agape love like never before. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us just to be real before one another and before you. And standing today realizing that we have been trying our best on our human efforts. And it's not adequate. And today, Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would come and fill them afresh with an agape love. That love that always protects. That love that always trusts. That love that always hopes. And that love that always perseveres. Fill them this moment. Grant them an understanding of how to show love in that situation. Today. Tomorrow next week or whenever it occurs. Thank you for your grace upon this moment. And while you're standing, let me remind you, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres.